All right. All right, let me start the screen share. Um, welcome back, everyone. And today we're gonna to talk about cohomology and tropicalization. And here we're gonna bring a bunch of the ideas together and make contact with tropical homology. And I'm gonna talk about two classical approaches to the cohomology of algebraic varieties. Um, one for simple normal crossings, compact applications, and the other for semi-stable degenerations. And these both have their origins in the work of Deline, although I guess what I'm about to tell you is probably more classical and may even go back to Poincaré, I'm not even sure. Okay, so the setting is I'm gonna have um, a smooth and projective algebraic variety over C, and then I'm gonna have an open subvariety whose complement is a simple normal, normal crossings divisor. So, I'm going to view U as the complement of union of the smooth divisors DI that intersect transversely. And then the question asking is, what can I say about the cohomology of the open guys in terms of the cohomology of the intersections of the simple normal crossings divisor? And here I include the empty intersection, which is all of X. And We've already seen how tropicalization of a variety defined over C is sort of a map to a stratification of it. And if the variety is Shun, then we can get a simple normal crossings divisor by subdividing the ambient torque variety or by refining the fan for the ambient torque variety. And you should, what you, the way you should think about the question of this cohomology is it's some kind of inclusion exclusion. So, I start with X, I have to remove each divisor DI. Then I have to add back in the double intersections and I have to subtract out the triple intersections and so on. So it's inclusion exclusion. There's a motivic approach to make that literally true. And if you're curious about that, there's some fantastic papers by Bittner on like motivic zeta functions. And like there's one on the presentation of like some um, ring of motives. I forget the title of that paper, but it's really good. Okay. So I'm going to start with like a local analysis of, I'm going to try to come up with a Durand model for the cohomology of U, and I'm going to start with a local analysis near the normal crossings divisors. So I'm trying to remove the normal crossings divisors, and in some sense, I'm going to let make put them really far away. And what's far away than allowing your functions to have poles on it? Okay, so remember normal crossings means I can pick coordinates so that the divisor D is cut out by setting some of the coordinates equal to zero. So it's the union of some coordinate hyperplanes. And we say a differential form has log poles along the divisor D is omega and its differential have a pole of order at most one along D. And I guess since the divisors are normal crossings, we have to worry about what that means. You can talk about generically on each component and so on. So if I study differentials with log poles, well, locally, they have a descript at a point in the intersection of K of the divisors, they have the following form. So here's the log pole, and then here's some coefficient, which is just a, Here's a differential form of log pole, and then here's a coefficient um, with um, like near p, or here's a function near p, and then log poles for the first k coordinates, and then since we're not on d, here's just regular differential forms, and I can form the Durham complex by wedging this up. I take the exterior algebra on this. And it turns out that this computes the cohomology of U. All right, so I kind of turn one problem into another problem, find the cohomology of U to find the cohomology of this funny complex, which I have no intuition about. All right, 
Now to get a better handling, a better handle on these differential forms, I'm gonna study them near a divisor and I'm gonna use a residue map. So like the idea is I have like a DZ1 over Z1 and I can think of that as a pole and I can take the residue of the pole along the divisor cut out by Z1 equals zero. Okay, so what it does is it goes from um, log forms of degree P to log forms of degree P minus one, but it goes from, um, these are on the ambient space axis is on a component of the divisor DI, and then the logs are allowed on the intersection of the other divisors with DI. So I'm like picking up the residue on the divisor DI. And the way I do it is I rewrite my differential form, isolating the DZ, DZK over ZK component, the component that has a log pole along ZK. And then the residue is this, this differential form and it's well-defined. And this generalizes the classical residue where the residue of DZ over Z is equal to one. All right, and as I said, the cohomology of this Durham complex with log poles is the cohomology of U. Now I kind of lied. What I really mean is the algebraic Durham cohomology. You like, because we're working with holomorphic differential forms, where the Durham complex isn't a cyclic. So we have to work with hyper cohomology which is annoying, but standard. And the proof that the cohomology of U is the hypercohomology of this complex, it's essentially a check argument. And you just work out um, what everything is locally. And now I wanna relate the cohomology of this complex to the DI, something I can understand. And the way I'm gonna do that is by means of a spectral sequence. And a spectral sequence is a homological gadget. And there's several different approaches, but I'm gonna think about it as the following. I have a filtration on my complex and I'll tell you which filtration it is in a sec. And I don't really understand this complex very well, but I understand the associated gradients of this filtration. And a spectral sequence is a machine for, for going from the associated gradients of the complex to the associated gradients induced on the cohomology. And you need more than just what the terms are in the spectral sequence. You need the differentials, which generally you won't know, although you can eliminate a lot of things or the spectral sequence, or maybe you know it in low degrees and er, on an early page of the spectral sequence and that's good enough. Okay, so what is the filtration? Well, it's gonna be um, a filtration by how much of a pole we're allowed. So here are the regular differentials, the usual differentials on X. That's omega x, here are the log differentials. And what I'm looking at is differential forms that, you know, this is of course a complex of sheaves. Um, so this is a filtration on sheaves. Um, what I'm allowing is differential forms that have poles of some order, meaning like, for m equal to zero, this are, these are regular differential forms. For m equals one, we have differential forms where it's a usual differential form wedge with a differential form, a log differential form of order one. So in particular, you're allowed to have one DZ1 over Z1. So, and we're gonna try to make sense of it in terms of the residue map. So if I have, a, so if I look at these, these are all kind of lies, this is just a heuristic. But if I 
elements of W1 are allowed to have a simple pole along one divisor. Uh, elements of W2 are allowed to have a simple pole over a pair of divisors. And we can think about what happens in their intersection. Now, if we look at the associated gradients, we have differential forms of a simple pole along one DUI quotient by regular differentials. And if you think about this as, a, as uh, an associated graded complex of sheaves or an associated graded of the sheaf, what we're allowing is, is differentials that have poles along the DIs, but we're modding out by regular things. So all that's left is the pole along DI and that's captured by the residue. Um, for W2 mod W1, these are guys that are allowed to have a pole along a pair of divisors modded out by guys that have poles along a divisor. So what's left out, left out is, or what's new in this quotient are the residues along the intersection of two divisors. All right, so the plan is to take the associated graded of the complex of sheaves to the associated graded induced on its Duran cohomology. All right, now let me try to write this a little bit more geometrically. I'm gonna let D zero be the zero fold intersections of divisors. For a positive integer M, I'm gonna let let dm be the m-fold intersections of divisors. So this is the disjoint union of di as i varies over um, i varies over m element subsets of the of the indexing set for the simple normal crossings divisor. So we're just looking at I, we're looking at all possible intersections of M of our divisors. Okay, and so the spectral sequence I'm gonna write down is one that will converge to the cohomology of the open guy and takes as input the, the, the hypercohomology of the associate or the E0 page of the spectral sequence is the WIs or the associated gradients. The E1 is the hypercohomology of the associated gradients. So, but the, we can use the residue map to compute the hypercohomology of the associated gradients. And they're just the, the usual cohomology of the intersection of the divide intersections of the divisors. And this is cool. Now we're computing the cohomology of closed things. And this is something I can understand, kind of. Like whenever you look at a spectral sequence, it's got some funny indexing upstairs. Um, it's usually impossible to parse. So let's just write down what this means. Okay, so let's stare at this for a sec. Uh, how's everyone doing? What's that? Okay, so the horizontal map is induced by the Giessen map um, given by the inclusions, but there's some funny signs. And the signs come from commuting DZIs over ZIs, like in the definition of the residue map. Uh, on, on the components. What's that? To define the signs, we need to fix the order of the components. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the signs are defined up to a sign. Okay, now, okay, let's stare at this for a bit. Like, I like thinking of this as inclusion exclusion. So, like here is the cohomology of X. Now, this entry, this column is displaced by one row, or sorry, by one, this column is displaced by one column. So it, it, it sort of comes with a negative sign, it takes away. So that's like removing the divisors. And then the next one would be D2, and that's like, that's displaced by an even number. So that's like adding in the twofold intersections. 
And I can make that a little bit more precise in a sec. Okay, now this spectral sequence degenerates at E2, which means I compute the cohomology of the differential here, which is just horizontal. And then I am done. I don't have to worry about funny differentials that go like that. Okay, so let me give you a precise version of inclusion exclusion. If I take Euler characteristics, the Euler characteristic is preserved by, is, by, is unchanged by taking the next page of the spectral sequence. So I can just take the Euler characteristic of the E1 page and get the cohomology, get the Euler characteristic of the Durham cohomology. And if you write down what that means, it really is the Euler characteristic of X minus the Euler characteristic of the single intersection or the single divisors. And this is really a disjoint union of the divisors. This is the twofold intersections and so on. And there's some sense in which you can even generalize that further if you're taking uh, different things that act like Euler characteristics, like chi y characteristics or Hodge-Dillon polynomials. Okay, let's stare at the top row. This is actually kind of cool because we talked about we talked about parameter or dual complexes. And remember, a dual complex was a complex whose vertices corresponded to components like of the divisor and then whose edges corresponded to components of the twofold intersections and whose triangles corresponded to threefold inter components of threefold intersections of the components and so on. All right, but let's look at the top row. This is H naught. This is just counting, sorry, this is, it's too early in the morning again. Um, this is, let's think about what type of object this is. This is an n-fold intersection of n divisors in an n-dimensional variety. That's going to be a point or empty. So it's, this is going to be an n minus one-fold intersection or components of an n minus one-fold intersection. So that's going to be a curve. So we're talking H2 of a curve. That's top dimensional cohomology. This is top dimensional cohomology of a divisor, and this is top dimensional cohomology of our original smooth proper variety. Everything inside is smooth and proper, so we're just picking up fundamental classes. So this is just counting the number of components in each intersection. This is the number of divisors. D2 would be the number of components that occur, arise as twofold intersections of a divisors, and so on. So this is really. The top row is computing the cohomology or the homology of the dual complex. Remember, this is this is counting just um, the C naught is oh, some professor. So I'm going to take away my math license for this. Um, this this guy would be counting C naught of the uh, of the dual complex that's the number of vertices this is just uh, a copy of c it's a one-dimensional vector space this is counting the number of of top dimensional cells in the parameterizing complex or in the dual complex so so the in the differential you'd have to work out the signs but it's just the usual differential in cohomology. So the homology of the dual complex is the highest weight bit of the cohomology of the open guy. So we have the following theorem of Paul hacking, which is that. All right, questions, concerns, complaints. All right, now, the dual complex is nearly the bounded cells in the tropicalization. Um, like there are more cells in the dual complex because 
the, these n-fold intersection or these k-fold intersection can be disconnected. But if it so happens that they're all connected or empty, then this guy is a deformation retract of the tropicalization. So if for all initial degeneration, if all de initial degenerations are connected or empty, you have this isomorphism of cohomology. All right, I'm about to change topics a little bit. So ask me questions right now. All right, let us consider a hyperplane arrangement complement. And I'm gonna to get to the Orlick-Solomon algebra or the Orlick-Solomon theorem, which is a combinatorial way of expressing the cohomology of such a thing. And I had kind of, when I was prepping these notes, I thought this was just an example of um, the, the above Deline spectral sequence. It's actually easier than that. I was really surprised. Um, and I think this is, this. I don't actually know why this works. I mean, it happens to work by like in a in pretty easy induction argument, but I don't really get what's special about hyperplane arrangements. But let's consider a hyperplane arrangement complement. This is not necessarily normal crossings. We can blow up the intersection of the HI to produce a proper smooth X so that the complement of U and X is simple normal crossings. And the cohomology of this X when we blow everything up is described by the feichner yusvinsky algebra, also known in the work, uh, my work with June and Kareem as the matroidal chow ring. So that's the cohomology of a closed thing. And then we can talk about what's the cohomology of the open thing. And it was originally a question, I think of Briskhorn, maybe something answered by Briskhorn that the cohomology of U is determined by the combinatorics of the hyperplane arrangement. It's the real cohomology is. I don't wanna say anything that's false. So I don't actually remember this. Okay, so let me just do a quick reduction. So everything looks like the usual theory of Orlick-Solomon algebras. I'm gonna remove, I'm gonna take my favorite hyperplane and remove it from my projective space to get a fine space. So then I look at the other hyperplanes that are left over. They gives me a hyperplane arrangement in a fine space. The complement of this hyperplane arrangement is the same thing as the complement of our original hyperplane arrangement in projective space. All right, and now I can pick out some differential forms that I like. Um, like I can take a linear form vanishing on one of the hyperplanes, then I have a one form of the form DA, DAI over AI. So this is a one form that has a simple pole on one of the hyperplanes. So you should be thinking like DZ over Z, except you're not in P1. Like I'm sure there's a projective version of the Orlick-Solomon algebra, but I feel like looking it up. All right, now the union of the HIs is not simple normal crossings necessarily but our description is good enough. So if you just tried monkeying around with these differential forms and tried building a cohomology theory out of them, you'd end up with the Orlick-Solomon algebra. So I have n hyperplanes in a fine space and I'm gonna introduce inde indeterminants E1 through En. I'm gonna look at the exterior algebra on them and then I'm gonna quotient by a certain ideal I. Okay, now I need to write down the elements. So I'm gonna, for a subset S of my hyperplanes, I'm gonna define ES to be the product of the corresponding EIs. So I'm writing, let's say I'm writing them in ascending order. And I'm gonna define a differential on them where I just remove one entry. And there's a sign. And now to define the ideal I, these are things I'm gonna be quotienting out. I'm gonna look at the E sub S where S is a subset where the corresponding hyperplanes intersect as the empty set. 
or the soot. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of imagining, like I, I imagine a differential that has like a simple pole on that intersection, but that intersection is empty. So I don't have to worry about the, that differential. And then I look at D of ES if the linear forms AI uh, form a linear for, for I ranging over S is a linearly dependent set. So what I'm in some sense, what this is saying is I have a bunch of hyperplanes that intersect too much. Imagine like having um, three lines intersecting at a point. I don't know if I'm coordinate enough to do this, uh, intersecting at a point in the plane. So if I have this triple intersection, this could occur as the intersection of any pair of them. In some sense, this is writing down the relation that quotients that out. And then the Orlick-Solomon algebra is the, this E, the exterior algebra on the EI is quotiented by I. And then it's a pretty fun theorem of Orlick and Solomon and Griscorn that the Orlick-Solomon algebra really does compute the cohomology of the hyperplane arrangement. To that cohomology of the hyperplane arrangement complement. And it's determined by the matroid of the union of the HIs. And it's pretty cool. There, there's fun ways of getting characteristic polynomials out of this stuff and whatnot. All right. So is everyone happy? Because I'm now going to talk about semi-stable degenerations, and this is an order more complicated. And Oh yeah, I think everything I said probably works for reasonable enough cohomology theory, presumably. Like you'd have to do something else to replace residues. Okay, but you probably just need some kind of geese and map or something like that. All right. All right, now I'm gonna do this in the analytic setting, like the complex analytic setting. Um, everything. So I'm going to work towards a uh, spectral sequence of Steenbrink, but there's one in a tau cohomology due to uh, Rappaport and zinc, and then there's one in like in some in like a, some version of piatic Duran cohomology, something called a uh, log piatic Duran cohomology, and yeah, called. I'm about to lie. So it's related to Hyoto, Hyoto Kato cohomology um, due to Macrain. All right, but we're gonna I'm gonna tell you the analytic story, which is a little easier to understand. Um, so I'm gonna start with my valuation ring. I'm gonna work over a family, and I'm actually gonna work over a legitimate family rather than a formal family. I'm gonna let O be the ring of germs of analytic functions of a neighborhood of the origin. So I'm just going to look at thing analytic functions you can just imagine on a small disk around the origin. I'm going to let k be its field of fractions. Since we're talking about the neighborhood of origin in the origin, so I'm looking at the quotient of one holomorphic function by another up to, as a germ in the neighborhood of an origin. So really, you can view you can shrink. If I'm looking at functions on a disk, I can shrink the disk so that the only pole is at the origin. So I'm just looking at meromorphic functions that may have a pole at the origin. The maximal ideal of my valuation ring are functions vanishing at the origin. So the quote, the residue field is C. So I'm literally looking at a family over a small disk. And when I look at the fiber, the what I'm calling the closed point, because I've been hanging out with number theorists, I'm really looking at just the fiber over the origin. I'm gonna let X be a semi-stable family over O. So it's just some, family defined over a small disk around the origin. I'm gonna let D star be the punctured disk. And I'm gonna write F for the projection down to the disk. And the total uh, semi-stable, this family is regular. And then away from the, the central fiber, this guy's gonna be smooth and the, the closed fiber, or sorry, the central fiber has, is just a normal crossing divisor. I mean, there's more to it. There's something about how the nodes form or how the, the double points form, but it's all good.
Okay, so I'm interested in the cohomology of what I call the generic fiber. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at some point near the origin, that not at the origin, I look at the fiber there, I look at the cohomology of that, and those are all isomorphic by Erisman's theorem, because if you have a smooth map that gives a vibration, so you can just move the cohomology around from one fiber to another. And then I'm going to name the components of the central fiber. It's a union of these divisors, di, and then I write d sub i for the intersections. All right, so the question I ask is, how do I find the cohomology of the generic fiber from the cohomology of the di? All right, so this is already really similar to the Deline spectral sequence, probably was inspired by it. And unfortunately, there's lots of copies of stuff, so it's going to be a complete mess. So I'm going to write DK for the disjoint union of the k-fold intersections. And then I have this spectral sequence, which converges to the cohomology of the generic fiber. So this came from rewriting, uh, I want to say it's a Deline spectral sequence. And that's a, that's a little bit more tractable. So it, it at least it was inspired by it. Steenbrink's arguments were complex analytic, but it's, I think it's, it's rewriting some spectral sequence in I think SGA seven, SJ seven and a half, something like that. Do you know how fun, read SGA seven. It's like, it's like incredibly detailed and you can like read it like a novel. It's that fast. Um, like, like, I mean, I think parts of it were written by what, like Katz and Deline, but it's like got the very Grotendieckian style. All right. So it's a bunch of copies of the Deline spectral sequence. So let me try to draw some, draw some spectral sequences. So I'm going to consider the case of curves. And I think everything I knew, this particular case was probably known to like, I don't know, Poincaré and Lefschetz or Picard and left shots. Probably everything, I'm, the, the one dimensional case was probably known to Picard and left shots over the complex numbers. So here's what the spectral sequence looks like. So here is a copy of the Deline spectral sequence for the closed fiber if it was like a vibration, or sorry, if it was like a stratification, if it was like a normal crossing compactification. Then Here's a cop, here's an abbreviated copy of it. So it's just this corner piece of it. So the all but, you should think all but the last column. Okay, so let's stare at this thing. All right. So I have a degenerating family of curves. So these curves are breaking up into simpler curves. And, and, and now, if I want to understand the first cohomology of such a thing, that corresponds to this diagonal. All right, now, here is the, here's the cohomology of the components of the curve. Okay, now, here is something combinatorial. Here is also something combinatorial. And some of it is coming from the residues of differential forms on the curves. I'm gonna lie, it's one of these two guys. I can't remember which. Um, all right, so I can rewrite this in terms of the, the dual complex of the curve. And this is a pretty understandable thing. If I have my curve degenerating into simpler curves that intersect in nodes um, to each component of the degeneration, I associate a vertex and to each node, I associate an edge. This is, this is picking up the, the, the nodes or the, the edges. This is picking up the vertices because it's the top dimensional cohomology of the components. This is the zero dimensional 
homology of the components. So it's also picking up the vertices or the, the components. And then here it's picking up the nodes. This is like a Giessen map. This is just restriction on cohomology with signs. So when you work it out, you get homology of the dual complex and cohomology of the dual complex. And if you think about this a lot, this ought to make sense. Oh yeah, and this degenerates at E2. I mean, it's a, it's a theorem that such things are degenerated at E2, but there's nowhere for the differential to go for in the case of curves. So what you're left with is the homology of the dual complex and the cohomology of the dual complex and the cohomology of the components. And this is good because you expect Poincaré duality to hold. Um, let's look at the middle cohomology, which is the only case where anything is interesting. And here's the cohomology of the components. They should have Poincaré duality. And you have this thing. This is a homology term. It has to pair with something. What it has to pair with is cohomology. Yay. All right, and let me be more explicit here. The zero homology is like the zero, is computed by the zero homology of the Duke complex. The second cohomology is um, computed by the zero homology of the dual complex. And then the middle cohomology, the only interesting part, has a filtration where the smallest sub is the cohomology of the dual complex. And then this subquotient is the homology of the dual complex. And then this subquotient is the cohomology of the curve. So actually, that actually gives me the answer of what's going on. What, like, because let's see. This thing, okay, what is a sub in here? Well, you couldn't mandate, I think the residues vanish. So I think this course, yeah, this corresponds to the residues at, of differential forms at the nodes. All right, for surfaces, it's more involved. It's kind of tractable. Like I would like to think about it more for surfaces. I've been on my list of things to do for about more than 10 years. Um, notice that the, the top is a copy of the homology of the dual complex and really, should I be saying it's the, Did I goof this? Did I forget something here? No, no. At the top is the homology of the dual complex. We identify the top arrow with homology, but the, uh, the, the top row with homology, but the lower one with cohomology. Like yeah. Cohomology, I can understand. It uh, looks like a cellular complex, but uh, why, the, why, why is yeah, the top row homology? Oh, um, Let me see before I lie. Um, because this should be picking up, this is picking up fundamental classes of intersections. And then the, the map again is the Giessen map. Um, All oh, right, so, so if the, the dimension drops, uh, I guess, yeah, they're, they're all yeah. also one dimensional, but for a different reason than the lower uh, row. Yeah. Okay, so, so we can understand this piece and this piece. 
But then what's in between? And is there a good way to describe it? Is it combinatorial? Now, it may not be combinatorial because these I-fold intersections may, can have interesting cohomology that are not described by combinatorics. But I'm going to show you a case that's definitely combinatorial. And now this, this talk was written last week. Um, so I flubbed, totally flubbed the question about tropically smooth varieties at the end of last lecture. It was already in my talk. So I'm going to, so what the case where it's described by combinatorics is it's going to set the stage for tropical homology are tropically smooth varieties. And these are varieties such that tropicalization of the tropicalization locally looks like the tropicalization of a linear subspace. So I have to explain what the tropicalization of a linear subspace is. So I'm going to let V be a linear subspace or sorry, a projective subspace of n-dimensional projective space. And I'm gonna consider the intersection of that guy with the, the maximal torus in Pn. So that's what I'm really doing is I'm just removing all the coordinate hyperplanes from V. So, and let's suppose that V is not contained in any coordinate hyperplane. So, the coordinate hyperplanes, if I intersect them with V, they give you a hyperplane arrangement on V. So V intersect C star to the N is the hyperplane arrangement complement. So I'm going to let HI be the coordinate hyperplanes, I guess, intersected with V. And then I look at the I-fold intersections. Now, these are actually pretty nice because we're just talking about intersecting hyperplanes. So they're always connected. They're always smooth. So it's as nice as can be. And I need to talk about a way of indexing the intersections. And that leads to the notion of a flat. So a flat is a subset of the hyperplanes so that V intersect HI is not empty. And for any bigger set, um, the intersection is different. So if I intersect one more hyperplane, I get something definitely smaller. And the idea is I'm looking at um, the sets of intersections of these hyperplanes. And I want to know, I want to describe a set uniquely. So I take all the hyperplanes containing it. So I'm looking at the biggest set that gives the same intersection. And that so flats, let me talk about those intersections uniquely. So let gives me, lets me name them. And flat, and you can co combinatorialize the notion of flats leading to a matroid. You can write down some combinatorial axioms, flats satisfy, um, but there are, and that such a structure is a matroid, but there are, but there are matroids that do not arise from hyperplane arrangements. Okay, and now I'm gonna describe its tropicalization. I'm gonna describe it by actually telling you what the tropicalization is. So I need some notation. Um, now V lives in an n-dimensional torus or V intersects C star to the end is in an n-dimensional torus, but I don't wanna favor the zero Piper plane. So I'm gonna to need to pick some notation. So I'm gonna make everything live in Rn plus one. So I'm gonna take a basis for Rn plus one, and then I'm gonna form an n-dimensional space as the quotient of n plus one, Rn plus one by the diagonal vector. And then for a subset of the zero through n, I'm gonna let E sub i be the sum of the corresponding, the sum of the corresponding basis vectors. And now I talked about flats. I can consider a flag of flats. So those are just it's a chain of flats. And I can describe a cone attached to a flag of flats as the non-negative span of the E sub Fi's. So to each flat in this flag, I have a vector, I take their non-negative span. And then the Bergman fan of V, it's a fan in N whose cones are all the sigma Fs corresponding 
to flags of flats. And then like if V is K dimensional, um, a flag of flats is gonna be of length K. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the indexing wrong, but if V is, is K dimensional, the tropicalization ought to be K dimensional. And I'm gonna give each top dimensional cone multiplicity one. And then it's a theorem in a paper of Ardila Clivens based on the work from of Bernd Sturmfels of the tropicalization of the intersect C star to the N is, is BV. And I guess according to, this is called the Bergman fan. Maybe this, is, this theorem is actually due to Bergman, um, at least for some different depth, for some definition of tropicalization, this theorem is due to Bergman. And it's ex, this tropicalization is explicitly determined by the matroid of V. All right, and here's a theorem that's probably due to McCulkin and Ziegler. Um, I wrote it down in a paper with Sam Payne, which is that if X is a subvariety of PN that when I intersect with C star to the N, and I guess I need to impose the condition that's not contained in any coordinate hyperplane. Oh no, I took closure here. Um, but if the tropicalization of this guy is the Bergman fan of some matroid, all of in the top dimensional cones have multiplicity one, then if I take the intersection of X with the big open torus and I close it up, this is a linear subspace realizing the matroid M. Okay, so this is saying if, if X has a tropicalization of a linear subspace, it's a linear subspace. And I, got, I was the one who started calling it the duck theorem. It's a, based on a way of identifying communists. You know, if it walks like a duck, um, swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. All right, so this was from like the Red Scare in the 50s. It's like a, something I probably McCarthy said, I don't know. Okay, so now I need one more observation before I describe tropically smooth varieties. I need the following observation, or I need to describe this one more definition, which is called this, which I call the star quotient. Um, so given a polyhedral complex, sigma and a face P of sigma, the star of P is what the situation locally looks like near P. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a point in the relative interior of P, and I look at vectors pointing out from the point W. So the star is the set of all vectors V, such that if I walk a small positive direction in the direction of V from W, I'm still in the polyhedral complex sigma. All right, now certainly I can walk in the directions of the span of P. So I'm gonna mod out by those. And then this gives me a polyhedral complex. So uh, the possible directions I can walk and stay in sigma and I mod out by the directions along P. So, and I drew this one in correctly. Um, so if I were to look at the star quotient of this, well, P is just a point. And I've got three directions I can walk in. So locally, it looks like that. If I were to look at here, I had two directions, but they're both along P. So the star quotient is just a point. And a variety X is said to be tropically smooth if the star quotient of its tropicalization is at every point is the Bergman fan of some matroid. And it, I think it's with respect to some choice of basis, not a standard choice of basis across all vertices. And here in, in particular, this needs the multiplicity of every, of every polyhedron in the in trop of X is one. 
Okay, so if X is tropically smooth, what can we do? Well, we can produce we can produce a polyhed we can take a polyhedral complex uh, supporting X. We take the associated torque scheme of that polyhedral complex. We look at X inside of it. We close it up to get a scheme over O. And then we look at the central fiber. And what the duck theorem says is that this central fiber is a union of linear subspaces meeting along smaller linear subspaces, or I guess projected subspaces meeting along smaller projective subspaces. I really should say projective here. So I think and Okay, and these DIs are all closed things, so they're definitely not described by the oral Solomon algebra. They're defined by me. I, they would probably be, their cohomology would be given by matroidal chowerings, but um, there's some, there's fun, some funny bookkeeping that lets you get away with using the oral Solomon algebra. I've never understood that step. But then you can plug in the cohomology of the pieces into the Steenbrink spectral sequence, turn a crank, and commute, compute the cohomology of X. And in some sense, tropical homology is combinatorializing that recipe. By which I mean, thank you. So questions, concerns, complaints. Uh, arrangement of hyperplanes, planes, which is not um, uh, just that hyperplanes planes are not meeting uh, transversely, so that they're not an SNC divisor. And I, if I consider the corresponding problem fan, mm -hmm. uh, and I find some variety that has this astropicalization, mm -hmm. what, would, what would be the central fiber? Um, if it's just a Bergman fan, if it's, then it's the original linear subspace. So these tropically smooth things, this is only really interesting for things that are not fans. Like if you had something like this, this would be an example of something tropical smooth, tropically smooth or. Um, like the, this model that you obtain uh, by closing in this toric horizon corresponding to. Oh yeah, nothing changes. You just get the same. So when you close it up, if it's already a Bergman fan, you'll get this name from your site page. Something is it not necessarily some stable? Um, oh wait, are you saying so if you have a linear subspace over K that has a particular Bergman fan? Um yeah, so in that case, um, um I see what you're saying. So you're saying you get a Bergman fan over the generic fiber. Uh, or may try to, for the generic fiber, but may, maybe it's defined over K and there's some degeneration. And yeah, that's what you get, you do, you can get something interesting. So you get, um, you can get a, am I about to lie? I'm about to lie. Um, so I should be really careful. Like there's a theory of evaluated matroids that study the generations of linear subspaces. And there's a whole theory of matroid polytope subdivisions, which this is related to, but I'm about to lie. So I'm going to be real careful. Uh, like the assumption of, of the student ring spectral sequence is that we are in a semi-stable situation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, then, uh, inside of semi, everything inside is semi-stable. You're good. So I, I'm just trying, trying to understand where from do we get that the this recipe that you told, told us about oh, uses yeah, why, stable de degeneration. Oh, yeah, yeah, why? Yeah. Oh, because you produce a polyhedral complex and then you subdivide the polyhedral complex to get a semi-stable torque scheme. And once you have a semi-stable torque scheme, um, 
your subvariety, since every initial degeneration is smooth, your subvariety is shun. So in particular, the um, fork variety induces a semi-stable degeneration on your scheme, on your subscheme. So it inherits semi-stability from the ambient torque variety, but only because it should. And it requires actually a little, a tiny bit of work because, or some work, because you have to actually prove that initial generations are all reduced. Um, like you have to worry about embedded points. There was actually a gap in one of my papers that Dustin Cartwright patched. All right, more questions. To say a bit more before the end of the lecture, or is this it? What's that? Did you did you want to say um, more, or you just stopped for questions? No, I'm done. I got okay. to the point where I need okay. to get. Okay.